Tennessee's Wild Side, broadcast for nearly two decades, was originally created through a vision of the Jackson Foundation. The Foundation remains a supportive partner in the mission to educate viewers about wildlife, natural resources, and opportunities for outdoor adventure. Hi friends, welcome to the Wild Side. I'm Steve Hall. If you ask how the Eastern Hellbender got its name, you'll most likely get more than one colorful story. If you ask what's it like to hold one, you may get a few detailed descriptions. But if you ask why does the Hellbender need to be repopulated in Tennessee, you'll get a unified answer from a team of scientists, all working together. Fifteen amphibians are already in hard cases, loaded up and ready to go. So this is the last hellbender to leave the safe surroundings at the zoo, where they were raised and bred. It's emotional for several reasons. I mean, I work with endangered species, and any time that you can restore a state endangered species to its native habitat, it has a good day. A convoy heads from the zoo to the interstate, driving for an hour and a half, ending up on a dirt road into the Laurel Hills Wildlife Management Area. This is where 13 hellbenders were released a few weeks ago, here in the Little Buffalo River. It's a hidden gem. The water quality is good, the habitat's good, it's great. 16 more are scheduled for release today. Hellbenders have been on the decline since the 1980s and are on the Tennessee endangered species list. So we're working with the Eastern Hellbender. This is a release of zoo raised animals with the long-term goal of trying to build a, a strong and healthy population of hellbenders for as long as possible. A team of scientists and students get ready for the release. Picked a good day for it, nice and warm. Canoes are needed to transport the hellbenders. Tight-fitting wetsuits are the preferred, but not necessarily the most comfortable wardrobe of the day. Several of the people here have worked hard and waited years, hoping this would happen. Oh man, this has been a lot of years working together, and so getting to come out today was a highlight of the career for me. Lo and behold, this has been in the making seven days a week for six years, and here we are. This is the day. This is a great day for all the many partners in Tennessee Wildlife Resource Agency to start this restoration project of Eastern Hellbenders. This is the first time Eastern Hellbenders have been reintroduced into the state of Tennessee. It's just an amazing project. Winds whip through the leaves and ripple the waters of the Little Buffalo River, where the Hellbenders will make their new home. All you have to do is look down to see there's plenty of food here for them to eat. There's a ton of crayfish, there's lots of little fish, so there's really no excuse for starving out here. This location was chosen not only for its ample food supply, but also because a small population of hellbenders was already surviving here. I've snorkeled in my region on the Cumberland Plateau in Middle Tennessee for years and not been able to, to see very many of these individuals, and so to come here and find them and find reproducing populations and then augment those populations to help it better itself is great. The fact that we actually have the animals in the stream indicates that we have a fairly healthy stream ecosystem. Like most amphibians, they're very sensitive to environmental disturbance. So the fact that they're actually here indicates that this is a high quality watershed. The water temperature is cool and refreshing as the team moves downstream, sloshing across slippery rocks that threaten to sweep your feet out from under you at any moment. But such challenges are common on missions in wilderness areas. Oh, sorry. <laughs> it's easy to see how the hellbender's coloration is a near match for this environment. Each one has been placed in a travel bag with water that originated from this river. And there is a sense of excitement since several people involved in preparing for this project will personally be able to place a hellbender into its natural habitat. It's just really hard to get away from the zoo sometimes, but today I was able to get away and come do this, and so being able to release a hellbender was absolute highlight. Been working with these guys since the beginning, since the day they were um, bred in captivity, and now getting to release them was just huge, huge deal. Several weeks ago, Dr. Hannah Schwartz surgically implanted transmitters to track the hellbender's movement in the water. It was done humanely with anesthesia and pain medication in the zoo hospital. 
Now, after monitoring the recovery, she gets to let one go. Oh man, they're kind of slimy. <laughs> but super awesome. Uh, just little uh, wiggle worms, but they're fantastic. And the one I got to release today, just beautiful, that orange and black speckled. They're all really unique. And so it is throughout the day, moving each time to another area with a good place for a hellbender to crawl under a rock. And people closely connected with this work taking turns, giving a helping hand to a natural resource. Chris Simpson has been on the front lines of this endeavor from the start. It's an awesome experience to be able to reach in that bag and pull that critter out and hold him and squirm him around and feel the life in that individual and put him in, in the habitat that they should be found in was a great experience. Their bodies are actually meant to handle the, the aquatic stress. And uh, if you actually look at the hellbender from top to bottom, they're very dorsal eventually flattened. So they're made to fit under really tight rock spaces. So what looks really uncomfortable for us probably feels just right at home for a hellbender. This one's garbage can and she's my favorite. Um, she eats all of the food that the other ones didn't. Sherry Wright is the zoo's daily caretaker of hellbenders, and she has high hopes for this one. Because she's the biggest, and she eats the most, and she's like, I'm going to survive. I'm going to have tons of babies and do what I need to do. <laughs> Garbage can is actually less insulting than other names given to these creatures, like devil dog and snot otter. And there are various explanations of why it's called a hellbender. The way it's kind of described is that the first folks who actually found the hellbender, who actually were terrified by finding them, they described it as an animal bent on returning from hell. And one of the things that's really important for, for people that, that are fishing in any of the streams in the southeast, if they catch one, they're not poisonous, they're not venomous, they're not going to hurt you, please just take the hook out of the hellbender's mouth and release it back like you were releasing a fish. It would greatly help this species out tremendously. And this species needs all the help it can get. They lay between 500 and 600 eggs. I would say the, the survivorship of those eggs is probably less than 5%. So it takes a lot of work to get a hellbender in a stream to survive. The short-term goal is simply survival of the animals reintroduced in the Little Buffalo River. A secondary milestone is successful breeding, and then significant growth of the population in the long term. As part of her thesis for a master's degree at Tennessee State University, Marley McCara and two student assistants will be monitoring the hellbenders using technology to track the implanted transmitters. My thesis is basically spatial ecology of captive hellbenders and basically their relative movements. So we're seeing their daily movements within five meters is about how much a hellbender will move. They are kind of sedimentary, but I mean, you know, who doesn't like to sit on the couch and watch TV? So, you know, I guess that's their equivalent of sitting on the couch is sitting under a rock. But they do, they do have some fun, you know. They stick their heads out into the rock and the, when the prey swims by, they shoot their heads out and grab it. So, that's exciting. <laughs> the scientists involved in this project believe this effort is more than just a reintroduction of a declining species. They see it as a step in protecting the balance of this aquatic system. One of the primary foods that they eat are crayfish. And so we noticed that streams that don't have a lot of hellbenders have very high densities of crayfish. Tennessee is the most biodiverse inland state in America with over 1,400 species. And when any one species declines and becomes an endangered species, it affects the food web or food chain of all the other critters in that food web. And so they were here, they should be here. And if our water quality is declining to where they're disappearing, we need to do something about it. Really it was like, like a that. private moment between <laughs> me and Hellbender really flying free to live under his rock for the rest of his life. Those working on the project include TWRA biologists, scientists, staff, and interns from the Nashville Zoo, professors and students from Tennessee State University, Middle Tennessee State University, the University of Tennessee, and Lee University. And you're welcome to populate our website, wildsidetv.com for more information or to watch and share the many stories we produce here on the Wild Side. Tennessee's Wild Side has been a presentation of the Jackson Foundation in association with Rockwater TV.